Jack Denning, uh, former conductor, Milwaukee Railroad, live in Roslyn, married a local gal, retired off of there, forced retirement, and put 20 years for the State Highway Department out of Bullfrog and Hayek, working for the DOT on Snoqualmie, plowing snow and, and maintenance. When did you work for Milwaukee Railroad? I started in, uh, I came over from the Northern Pacific. We worked at Woodenville, I was in maintenance away, and I heard that they was putting two new trains on. Fall of 63, so I took a leave absence from the NP and came over here and got my paperwork, took it to Spokane, got my physical and everything okay, and came back and gave it to the agent, Jack Carter, who used to adorn this desk right here. This was on a uh, Monday night when I got back. The next morning I was shipped down. I think it was uh, like November the 8th, somewhere in there in 1963. Shipped to Beverly as a fireman on a four unit electric freight motor, pushing trains back and forth over that mountain until next spring. And long term issue is uh, they pulled the tracks up on us or the freight and everything and March of 1980 was my last run. You said you were a fireman? Well I started in fire, fireman service, train, uh, engine service actually and then the uh, the good voters of Washington State says we don't need that many people to operate a train. So they came out with what they call Initiative 233. It was a full crew law. And the voters all over the state of Washington elected to abolish uh, the full crew law. Consequently, we lost our jobs. And I uh, went to work on the section on the Milwaukee, right out of here for Sam Suko, who was a section foreman. And I spent the summer, then they said they needed trainmen, which is brakemen. So Joe Otto and myself, we applied and, and they took us. We went to, drove to Malden over uh, south of Spokane and established ourselves. And first call we went out, I flipped a quarter with Joe Otto and I lost by 30 minutes. And that 30 minutes cut my throat forever working at home again. Because Joe, he had 30 minutes seniority, he could stay here. And so I had to work all the branch lines and everything in eastern Washington and Idaho. <clears throat> Excuse me, which was no big deal. Like, I made more money over there and got a education and met a lot of good people. What did you do with your job? What was what from day to day? Well, uh, as a brakeman, of course, uh, there was three positions before they abolished the crew job, full crew law. You had a head brakeman a swing brakeman who did all the list work, and then you had a, a third brakeman who rode with the conductor. He was a flagman and protected you from other trains behind you and everything. <clears throat> and then eventually, in 1970, I was promoted to conductor, and then I ran trains, but mostly I worked on branch lines as a conductor. We worked a 16-hour day in those days, uh, six 16s on branch lines, he had Sunday off, and you worked 16 hours a day, and if you tied up for your rest on 16 hours, they had to give you 10 hours rest. And if you uh, tied up in 15 hours and 59 minutes, then they, you only had to take eight hours rest. If you took the 10 hours rest, then it puts your call time back two hours later the next day and really screwed you up. So we worked 96 hours a week on it's got to be tough for your conductor you're in charge of everybody. Uh, it's just probably no different from working at Safeways or someplace else. Once you learn a job, you do it and everything. You get a lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility. But railroading was a pretty dangerous job. And you relied on me to keep you alive and uh, vice versa. Uh, you could get killed pretty easy. Uh, I had a, one conductor that jumped off a freight car pushing in the potlatch force, big storage shed, loading docks in St. Mary's, Idaho, slipped, lost his footing, fell backwards, and cut him right in two. The train ran right over and the car's pushing in it. Uh, 
if he'd had another brakeman in those days, where he could have got way out on a curve and passed signals to the engineer, it probably never happened. But that's uh, that's beside the point. You were probably pretty close with all your coworkers. Yeah, uh, I still think old Red quite a bit. He kind of an honorary guy, but he was my friend. So. Sometimes the sometimes the uh, people who know you the most get turn, turn out to be your best friends after a while. Yeah. We had uh, one time I was firing on the Beverly Helper. Vern Barnhart, who was a conductor pilot, he's from Ellensburg, he just passed away a little bit ago. And we came over old Pete Highsmith from South Cleveland was the engineer. He was quite an old fellow when I went to work here. And he only worked a few more months after I came in 63, and then he retired. But we came down in the Kittitas early one morning and we hit a school bus and uh, knocked it off. And I wouldn't go back and look at it because I, I knew what the carnage was going to be. So Vern went back and he came back up and he said, well, we're in luck, boys. It was empty. The gal, the school bus driver, she got it stuck and, and uh, hooked the rail with the Ellison electric sander and everything. She went to get some help to get it off, but we helped her get it off, I guess. So, did you and, uh, did you and Red ever get in any trouble together? Uh, I'm not even going to bring answer any of those questions. Everything it, those days, you know, you're going to live forever. You're bulletproof, and, right. and uh, we did a we did a lot of a lot of things and everything. I had one brakeman at St. Mary's, Idaho, Joe Spiesman, his dad, Bud Spiesman, on the uh, Gem State Club and Bar Bar and Grill, and we only had eight hours off in between the jobs. And, of course, the bar and grill was closed, but Joe had a key to the back door, so we'd go up and kind of help ourselves to his dad's stock, and we'd get maybe three hours sleep every night. Well, what were the winters like? Around here? Yeah, just, we're just, and just work on the, the railroad. Well, the winters, uh, most of my, my uh, railroad, of course, was done in, over in eastern Washington and Idaho and everything, then out of St. Mary's. Uh, Idaho, up to Bowville, Idaho, and Elk River. We'd run the flangers and rotary plows up there to keep it open and everything there. But there's a lot of times I've seen winters up there where you could come right, right out of a window of a, one of the locomotives and scoop right out on the snow. That's how deep it was and everything. And if you tore a train in half or derailed in the snow, then they had these what they call butterflies for re-railing. And uh, they probably weighed, well, probably a good 80 pounds. Eventually, they came out with aluminum ones. But you had to pack those, and sometimes you had to crawl underneath the, the side of the boxcar and drag them to get to no more open space. And if you had to go a quarter of a mile to where the train was torn in half or something there, it got to be pretty bad. But we kept a, uh, on the branch lines a loaded caboose with hardwood wedges, butterflies, uh, the journal bearings, before they got Timken roller bearings, we had drums of uh, oil and waste and brass. We'd have to rebrass all the all the different cars and carry the waste oil back there and 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 uh, what they call journal pack and get those hot boxes. They'd start flaming. Sometimes they burn an axle off. It gets so hot. Then you'd really go on the ground. Memorable that you ever shipped? Was there ever um, anything interesting or was it usually pretty standard? Well, I can remember one incident that's really memorable. Orville Adams from Peel Point here was the engineer. Gary Favero was his fireman and I was a head brakeman. We was down in Othello and uh, they, instead of holding us in the depot, they gave us to go ahead. The train master was a young man from Minneapolis, his name was Gary New. Instead of holding us there, they had a big mudslide at a place called Totten, this side of Othello on a curve where we had a siding and a big substation. But they should have held us there. This mudslide was, oh, over an eighth of a mile long. Boulders in there, about half as big as a Volkswagen, filled and everything. It was six, seven foot of mud easy. But anyhow, they turned us loose 
And we had a slow order out there of 25 miles an hour, so we had to pull our speed down from 60 to 25 to come through that slow order. When we came into that slow order, this Gary knew this, his train master, he was giving us a big washout sign like this, stop, stop. He had a radio, he didn't even call us on the radio. So we thought the slow order was good yet for 25, well it wasn't. And there was a D8 Caterpillar with an uh, operator named Frank Schuler. we called him Shorty. He lived over here on 3rd Street in Clay Ellum. He was on that cat. Orville, he locked the air whistle down. Schuler looked back over it and he jumped off, took off and he just made the barbed wire fence and took off. We hit that cat, just totally destroyed that cat and turned the front and second unit sideways and I dropped on the floor of water coolers there and held on to it and Gary lit next to me and everything went flying and we got fired, Orville and, and uh, Gary and I, for 90 days because we, uh, we didn't obey that, that train master. Well, he had a radio and it would sure help if he told us the track was plugged. But it came at a real inopportune time for me because it was hunting season, so I just took my dogs and shotgun and a case of shells and spent the next 90 days traveling around hunting. Oh, and those days we contracted with the union. We bought job insurance. So consequently, all this time that I was being fired or penalized and everything there, I was dragging my wages through insurance. We used to get $8 a day unemployment. And then it went to $10, $20, $51 a week. That was our unemployment. And when they finally cut us off, it was all done railroading, it was still at $51 a week. Pretty tough to raise a family. What do you think was going to uh, come out of South Miami? Because I know it was pretty busy here during the during the rail when the railroad was was running. Well, it's a retirement community, and uh, you still get them moving in from different places and coming over here. Uh, boy, there's off very very few rails left around here at all. Milwaukee-wise, I don't know what it is, but South Cleome itself, uh, it's a survivor. It's a survivor, and just like Rosin. One time Rosin pushing 6,000, but it, uh, it's still a, a bedroom community, so to speak. So South Cleome to Clay Ellum or Ellensburg. It amazes you how many people live here and commute to the other side. I commuted, all of us did, when they pulled it the uh, depot station, the crew change out of here, we commuted eight and a half years to Port of Tacoma out of here. We'd get a three hour call and drive to, over there and we'd come right back through here, 50, 55 miles an hour. I have to tell you this, it's pretty neat. When we come out of the uh, big high act tunnel, I'd give my wife a call, she'd had the scanner on at home and all I'd do is pick up, hey lightning, out of the hole, 30 minutes. If I needed something, I'd tell her for this and she'd meet us down at the crossing, wherever the hog head was, like I need my shotgun or my vest or something, or we picking up somebody who wanted the bummer ride, they'd meet us down at the crossing, we'd jerk them on or I'd get my gear and we'd go and did that all the time. <laughs>